Okay, everybody, I would like to welcome you to Lesby uh, Theater for the New City and Art Lady presentation on East Village, Lens on the Lower East Side, Lesby's photo journal essay, our love story about the East Village. And I'd like to introduce right off the bat, Crystal Field, who's the director of Theater for the New City. And Crystal is going to give you a brief overview of TNC's role in the East Village and how they've welcomed artists here since 1984. Very good. So, um, well, you know, Theater for the New City is 50 years old this year. And um, I want to say that we started many years ago, uh, 1970, 71. Um, way, way by the Hudson River. And we were given a year and a half rent free in uh, West Beth. And we made three theaters there. And there was just about nobody around a way west like that. We were by West Street, um, by the trucks. And uh, after a while, uh, things began to change, and many, many artists were in the area. Why? Because the rents were low. Uh, things were difficult, but the rents were low. And uh, after two years, uh, the place gentrified quite a bit, and we lost our lease. We only had a lease for a year and a half. So we moved over to Jane Street, the Jane West Hotel. Uh, it had been an incredible hotel at one time for <clears throat> officers in the Swedish Navy. However, at the time we were there, it was uh, what they call a flop house. Um, only for uh, single men over 40. And we had our own little entrance and the main entrance to the building. People were dying on the steps. People were vomiting on the steps. Oh, maybe half an hour before the show, there would suddenly be some huge leak from upstairs. It was when we first went over there, I yelled out on the porch, little porch, which was the entrance. Hello out there. And there was no answer because the whole block was full of uh, warehouses that weren't working, you know, defunct warehouses. But a wonderful woman uh, artist named Ann Harris said to me, don't worry, Crystal, uh, if you do good work, people will come. And in the eight years that we were there, people did come. We had huge audiences and many, many, many artists, wonderful painters, sculptors. Uh, it was glorious. Um, in spite of the fact that, like I said, people were dying all around us. So, you know, what happened? It gentrified. Today, uh, there are condos on that block. Um, but where are the artists? What happened to them? They fled. They fled to the East Village to the East Village, where the rents were very low. The rents were so low. <clears throat> My ex-husband lived on 10th Street between B and C. He paid $42 a month rent. He was robbed three times. The third time, he put a lot of locks on his door. They took off the door jam, the whole thing. It was a difficult life. Artists flee to where they can afford to live. 
And a lot of times where they can afford to live may be a very interesting and exciting neighborhood because the East Village was very exciting and full of artists. However, you know, the drug dealers tapped you on the shoulder to sell you stuff. And we, of course, had to move. We moved from Jane Street to Second Avenue. People came to us and get down on their knees and thanked us for coming to the neighborhood. But you know what? After 10 years, our rent went from 2,500 a month to 8,000 a month. We went to court. We went to court without a lawyer. And we didn't, we won and we lost at the same time. That's the story of m many artists. Um, we won because they weren't allowed to raise our rent that way. But on the other hand, we had to get out. That was the other side. And a wonderful man from Goals, which existed at that time. I'm talking 1986. Good old Lower East Side was the name of the organization. It exists today. He found our building for us. It was so unknown. It wasn't even on the rent rolls of the city. The city owned it. Anyway, long story short, we bought this building. We bought it for $717,000. We put a $71,000 deposit on it and we had a mortgage the building is now worth i don't know 12 million but what good does it do an artist you can say look at that my dear you only spent seven hundred and seventeen thousand dollars it took you 26 years to pay off the mortgage now look what you can do you can sell the building for 12 million dollars and we say well where are we going to go so the East Village is hemorrhaging artists now. And you know why? Because we've gentrified. We are gentrifying. The outside world is coming. We have to do something about that. We have to be able to find affordable housing for artists. And we want the East Village to continue to be what it now is, what the West Village was until it gentrified, the artistic mecca of the city. That's what the East Village is right now. And, and as I said, it's, it's hemorrhaging. So I just wanted you to know that I know only too well about neighborhoods and how valuable they are and how important they are, and how important the artist is to its neighborhood. And unfortunately, how well it is able to gentrify the neighborhood by being there. Above us now, there is a condo. And they sold this condo, they called it the theater building. We tried to stop them from saying that, but we couldn't say, and that's what it says. So people moved in, you know, because there's art here and, and art is exciting and art is, says something and art makes you want to wake up in the morning. On the other hand, we don't want to be bought out. So the end story is, that this is a wonderful exhibit that's in the theater now. Unfortunately, we have COVID-19 and we have a terrible, terrible, I, I, I can almost say depression. It's really that bad. People are totally out of work. Hopefully we can proselytize and push for art in the next administration. Um, 
as you can see, uh, even when the restaurants open somewhat, the theaters are not allowed. We are shut. Um, you know, art is low on the totem pole. However, <laughs> it's the reason that everything else works so well. And that's something which I think we have to be able to tell the world more than we do. Artists, you know, uh, they, they speak through their art, but, but you know, you've, we've got to speak other ways too. So anyway, we're so glad this book is coming out. And even though we are shut, we are open online and this gallery um, exhibit is open online and the book and the gallery are all about the Lower East Side. This neighborhood that, that welcomed artists with open arms and a neighborhood that artists have really made famous and important in this city and, and in the world. So, um, all I can say is congratulations and uh, Lord help you at the same. Hi, um, I'd like to introduce Richard Mo. I, first, I wanna thank Crystal for her words about artists and how they impact on the neighborhood. And to tell her that she has been such an incredible support for all of the artists who live here. And she's an amazing woman and the theater is much love. Um, Richard, you just blinked me out again. <laughs> No, you're here. I'm just going to share the screen right now. Okay. All right. And I'd like to introduce Richard Moses, who is the president of Lesby. Um, Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, let me see if I can uh, do this in an intelligent way here. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's try this. Okay. Here we go. Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, yes, I'm Richard Moses. Um, we uh, started Low East Side Preservation Initiative in 2007. So we've been around for about uh, 13 years now. And our mission originally was for designation of historic districts within the uh, traditional Lower East Side, which includes uh, the East Village, of course, uh, Lower East Side below Houston Street, uh, Chinatown, Little Italy, and the Bowery. And uh, recently we expanded our mission to include individual landmarks uh, in the area. And we're now proposing um, several individual landmarks to the Landmarks Commission for uh, consideration. And we also get involved in um, issues that are uh, ancillary to preserving the historic character of the Lower East Side. It could be anything from zoning uh, to gentrification, trying to keep uh, small stores uh, open. Uh, even it's not, if it's not our primary mission, it's something that we're very concerned about. And we also do uh, educational programming. Um, and so uh, some of you may have seen some of our past programming. Uh, we have anything from book talks like what we have tonight to, to lecture events on Zoom and, and hopefully someday soon going back to live events such as, as tours and uh, illustrated lectures and that type of thing. So uh, I, Carolyn and I are gonna talk uh, for a couple of minutes about how the book came about. And um, what happened is, is, is a couple of years ago, uh, we had started hearing rumors that the Real Estate Board of New York was um, kind of publicizing that historic districts are areas that are um, really kind of, uh, dead, uh, gentrified, Disneyland type uh, environments that if people want to live there, they shouldn't want to live there. Uh, they shouldn't really want to work there. And so th this was kind of a strategy for the real estate board to oppose um, new districts uh, in the city. And so what we wanted to do was we wanted to um, come back uh, at them by saying, no, the districts are uh, very lively, uh, vital places um, that are enjoyed by people from all walks of life, all different backgrounds, different ages, and so on and so forth. 
And, and that's what these books uh, were really intended to be about. And we think that, that, that they've been um, successful uh, in that way. We have the, the, this book on the East Village, which we're going to talk about tonight. And then we have a companion book uh, on Chinatown, which is basically uh, the same format. So Carolyn, maybe you can um, talk a little bit about uh, how we put the books together. I'm going to get back to the beginning slide because I see I got myself on a uh, later slide here. Right. When Richard and I started talking about the idea of the book, um, I am the artistic director for an arts organization. Uh, most of my friends are artists. Uh, a lot of us have lived or live around the area of Tompkins Square Park. And um, we decided that we wanted to incorporate it as an arts organization and to promote the artist of the Lower East Side East Village area. Um, so at any rate, I know a lot of different people. Ono is also one of the artists who helped to form this organization. And when we started talking about the book, we decided that we wanted to engage people about the neighborhood and about how we live here in the neighborhood. Um, that it's not, you know, that a historic neighborhood is not dead. Um, that it's filled with life and a vitality of its own. And our particular neighborhood, because we have a lot of artists who happen to live here and who happen to love the neighborhood, the images are frequently reflected in their work. So what we decided to do was to reach out to photographers who were professional photographers in the neighborhood. We um, asked people to submit images and then we reviewed the images and picked out uh, the photographers that we thought would best represent a wide selection of different aspects of the neighborhood. So it's almost like it's um, because we love the neighborhood you know, and the people that we picked, we think that they love it too, and that their images reflect that love. And to show how human scale, and also how rich our neighborhood is. So at any rate, um, we started out with that, we asked Ono to do the graphic design, um, and the layout for the book. And then, um, we started with that premise and we picked the photographers uh, that there's Ono and Karen, George, Don Freeman, Alan Gastelum and Marlies Momber. Alan and Marlies were not with us, uh, you know, for this exhibit. So at any rate, we have a couple of their images on the wall, um, but Karen and Ono and George are with us. That's George hanging his work at the theater. These are images of Alan's work that we have hanging on the wall. So um, I hope that gives you an idea of how we started out this process. And then after we had the images and gave them to Ono, we reached out to Marilyn Appleberg um, as the author. And Marilyn created this wonderful text in the book because she too is a passionate East Village person and Lower East Side. And um, it's just, you know, it's been such a pleasure putting this together. And we're hoping that you will all enjoy this as well. Okay, um, so Richard, do you wanna introduce Marilyn? Yes, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Marilyn Appleberg, uh, the author of Les B's book, East Village, Lens on the Lower East Side. Uh, Marilyn is a writer by profession and has been an advocate for East Village Lower East Side neighborhood for four decades. Her focus has been on the protection, beautification, and in 1984, the extension of the St. Mark's Historic District, one of the first designated in Manhattan in 1969. In 2012, Marilyn was honored with a Village Award from the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation, recognizing 40 years as a community leader and neighborhood activist. She's been a strong and very generous supporter of Lesby since 2012. Let's uh, welcome Marilyn. Thank you, Richard. And I'll stop, stop the screen. Right Can you hear me? Yes, okay. 
Um, first of all, this, I, I'm going to do a visual brainwashing. This is the book. And um, I know I'm a part of it, but I have to tell you, I just reread it recently. And the, the photographs are magnificent. And it's just a gem of a book is all I can say. But it was also, I just want to tell you, one of the most interesting, my entire profession was in publishing. And um, it was one of the most interesting processes of, make, of putting together a book. And when, um, when Richard approached me, he asked me, um, he said they'd pay me a, a small honorarium and, and would I write a two page um, introductory history of the East Village. And um, I said, uh, okay, um, so should I see the photographs before I write this? And he said, no. And um, okay, I didn't quite understand that. And I didn't have to really meet the, uh, the designer either. Okay. And um, so I decided I was going to write this two page introduction. Um, the love of this neighborhood incidentally comes out of the fact that um, I moved here on January 26, 1969. I remember the date because it was my birthday. And um, I think it's by osmosis only, I think seven days before that date, the St. Mark's Historic District was designated. And I was moving into one of the buildings within, within that designation. But I always tell people when I moved to the East Village, it was the Lower East Side. And it used to be that people blamed real estate developers for the name to make it more trendy or hip. But um, I did a little bit of research and it was actually the New York Times that used the term first to talk about the fact that there were cheaper digs over in the East Village or the Village East than Greenwich Village. And that's why the hippies and the artists and the musicians came this way. Uh, those of us, when I moved into my apartment, my rent was 9901. Um, I loved that L1. I loved writing that check. Um, my mother asked my father after he moved me in if it was a walk up. My father said, no, it's a run up. I want her running up. It was not a good neighborhood, but I thought I had died and gone to heaven. My apartment looked like the set of La Boheme. It was as cold. I know it was dangerous, but there were times as with what Crystal said, my door fell off the hinge and when I go out to dinner, I would just put it in place. When you're young, you're a little bit stupid about safety. Um, in any case, I started writing and this was the first line that I wrote. One can easily make the case that few neighborhoods or even some small countries have had as long a history and undergone as many transformations as the East Village. Although some decades were the best of times and there were times when things could not get any worse, the East Village has often been down but it has never been out. It took a little over 350 years to go from Dutch farm to the pierced belly button of New York, but what a fascinating 350 years it has been. When I wrote that, I knew there was no way I was writing 500 words for Richard. When I handed the manuscript in, I had written 15,000 words. And Ono was the first one to see him and bless him. He told me, run with it, just do it. And Richard was sweet enough to accept all those free words. And um, basically the nature of the book changed. So um, the text is in between the marvelous, the marvelous <laughs> photographs. Um, the, uh, the, the street where, um, where I live uh, is where St. Mark's Church is and um, where Peter Stuyvesant is buried. The Dutch were here first. Many, can, many, many have said that um, the reason that um, 
New York and especially this area is as diverse and as um, tolerant as it is, is because in Holland at the time and in Amsterdam at the time, it was a tolerant and accepting and open society. And it was very much so when it came to New Amsterdam, except Peter Stuyvesant did not always live up to that. And when 23 uh, Sephardic Jews arrived on a Dutch ship, they had been uh, exiled from uh, Brazil. He was quite vexed. He sent me a message back to um, Holland that he had a Jewish problem and he wanted them expelled. And the, um, the Dutch West India Company um, told him that he needs to rethink that because many of the board members of the, his employer were Jews. So um, I think it's kind of wonderful that uh, Peter Stuyvesant's bones overlook the Yiddish Rialto where the theater mm -hmm. district of, uh, of the Jewish theater thrived. And um, I think you all know the cinema, the uh, mul cinema multiplex on 12th Street and uh, 2nd Avenue. It was built as the, as the Jaffe Theater in 1926. The, and it was the Yidd Yiddish Arts Company. And when the person who built it found out that it was being built on land that had belonged to Stuyvesant, he put into the cornerstone, which is just to the right of the entrance to the theater, a, um, uh, an image of the, um, of the founder of, the Yidd of Yiddish drama and um, right with him, nose to nose, to live forever, he put in an etching of Peter Stuyvesant. So on Second Avenue forever, this is where Peter Stuyvesant's image is residing. And I think it's kind of wonderful. Um, Stuyvesant was not a good man. He, he, he was a slave owner and, um, and um, quite intolerant. I think um, we can just be thankful that he uh, gave up to the British without a shot being fired. And um, I guess out of laziness or, or, or be, out of gratitude, the British left everything that the Dutch had put into place. And I think we all owe, um, owe him a debt of gratitude because I suspect if the British had gotten here first or if they had put their way of doing things, we would have been Boston. And um, nothing about Boston, I actually wrote a guidebook to Boston, but if you were going to give the cities ice cream flavors, Boston is vanilla and New York is Rocky Road. So I think we all know where we would, we would like to be. Um, so after the uh, Stuyvesant land was divided and the, the um, uh, the neighborhood quickly started to attract immigrants. Along the, um, the river was a thriving maritime uh, trade. There was a dry dock at the end of 10th Street. The companies were owned by Germans, wealthy Germans, but the workers were Irish. And um, by about 1840, um, there were so many Germans who came to this community that at that time, it was the um, largest German speaking population outside of the country, outside of Germany. And we have a couple of wonderful um, uh, landmarks on Second Avenue that thankfully were saved, the Ottendorfer Library and the, uh, the dispensary that were given to the community by the newspaper owner, um, uh, Ottendorf, Ottendorfer. Um, so let me just see, sorry, I have to, I read it a little while ago, so I just have to have a look. Um, and then of course, waves and waves of, um, of, it, of it, it, it's, it's been an amazing um, area. When you think about it, when you think that Manhattan is only 2.3 by 13 miles, and when you think about this one neighborhood, and you think about 350 years of Dutch, you know, English, Irish, German, 
In the 1880s, the Eastern European Jews after the war, the Ukrainians, the Poles, the Puerto Ricans, the Dominicans, more recently, the Japanese. It's such an amazing, welcoming place. And um, I think a, a real microcosm, a microcosm of, what, of what New York is. And um, I, I, I know that there are people who think, you know, the, the, the best days of the neighborhood for, are, are over, but I, I, I just don't think that way. And I think that, um, uh, you know, the arts in the East Village, they, they've had a formidable uh, track, track record. Um, and um, they've, it, I'll, I'll just read this. Uh, the arts have a formidable track record in the East Village, which served as a backdrop for many of the important literary and art movements of the last century. What most of these had in common was a rejection of the established way of doing things, a distaste for conformity and commercialism, a penchant for experimentation. It was the perfect description of the East Village, East Village resident in the 20th century. St. Mark's Church around 1911 had a, a rector named William Guthrie, who was a very open-minded, free-thinking person who welcomed communists and socialists to his church. And he was very interested in the, um, the marriage of spirituality and the arts. And um, uh, he invited people uh, to dance, to read poetry. Uh, Ruth St. Dennis danced there, Martha Graham danced there. I can't quite get right. Uh, Isadora Duncan was invited to dance there but she wanted to dance without shoes. This scandalized the congregation. I don't, I have not been able to ascertain whether she actually danced. Uh, uh, it, it, it was dubbed the Bo Bohemian Church. Uh, uh, Amy Lowell and Khalil Gibran were, were, um, were part of the congregation. And, um, when the neighborhood started changing and they had lost, the neighborhood only stayed posh for a little while. I mean, you can see some of the names of the, of the rich families in the cemeteries, the New York City Cemetery, Marble Cemetery and the New York, Marbles, uh, New York uh, City Cemetery. Even President uh, Monroe was buried for a short time before they moved him. Um, he was buried over there on, uh, on uh, Third Street. Um, so when, the congregate when St. Mark's was losing its congregation and the and the, the former private houses were being turned into rooming houses, uh, Guthrie decided that he was that the church was going to buy the houses on um, that not only were they being turned into rooming houses, they were being some of them were being turned into houses of ill repute. So he decided that the church would create its own congregation by buying up the houses on 10th and 11th Street and Stuyvesant Street. And I found a quote from him and he said, they were going to renovate them inside and out and make them suitable for men and women of arts and letters. And um, I found, a, they were called the St. Mark's Garth Apartments, Garth being Dutch for, for garden. And um, I had a list of in 1921, the people who lived there and I Googled a bunch of the names and what I was struck by is many, many of them were illustrators and many of them were women. And I could just see, they were from the Midwest primarily. And I could just see these women saying to their parents, it's a church, it's a church. I'll be perfectly safe. Um, so I happen to live in one of those apartments and I happen to have a North facing um, skylight um, and they did renovate, the church did renovate. And so there are artist windows on every floor as opposed to just, um, to just on the top. Something I found, I found out who had done that while I was researching the book. Um, about a block away in the 1950s, the abstract expressionism just really came to fruition in terms of artists coming there and deciding they wanted to uh, remove the middleman. They decided to run the galleries by themselves. Uh, we're talking about de Kooning, Franz Klein, uh, photographer uh, Saul Leiter who lived in, in uh, 
in my building. And um, the street was um, 10th Street between 3rd and 4th, which was a pretty nondescript street. And a very influential art critic at the time named um, Harold Rosenberg, um, who was a big supporter of the abstract expressionists. This is a quote from him, which I think is sort of interesting in terms of when Crystal was talking about the artists and the exciting. This is from Harold Rosenberg. The area was uninteresting and devoid of local color, having not even the picturesqueness of a slum. But to the artists, this no environment was interesting. So one night a month, all of the galleries, and there were many of them, something like 25, would have a new show opening. And the street was filled with collectors and, um, uh, and some of them, there was performance art. Uh, David Amram was playing, uh, Jack Kerouac was reading, uh, Bob Dylan was singing. Don't you wish you were there then? <laughs> I do. Um, so uh, that, that didn't last that long uh, because um, some of them got more famous than others and moved and moved uptown. Um, and of course, it wasn't until the 1980s that another uh, arts movement movement came uh, came to be over uh, in Alphabet City. It, that also lasted for for just a a short time. And you know, the, the names Basquiat and Maplethorpe, um, and of course, uh, you know, AIDS, high rents, AIDS. Uh, you know, put it into that very quickly. But for a short time, there were blue haired ladies coming to walk on the wild side. There were bus tours coming down from the Guggenheim. It was a very, very strange, um, strange sight. <sighs> okay, one minute. Mm. I should tell you, I once went into the apartment of Harold Rosenberg. There were Pollock's, John's, de Kooning, quite literally from the baseboard to the ceiling. If anybody had ever been to the Barnes um, exhibit before it, it moved to their, uh, to their uh, new building, I've never seen anything like that in my entire life. Not, didn't even bother with frames. It was, you couldn't see any of the wall. I mean, it was one of the most exciting things I have ever seen. And I, I had only seen it, uh, I'd only seen it once. Um, So when it came, the, the, the natural way to divide the book, um, one had to talk about the activism um, because so many movements came, really basically had their birth um, in this area from social reform to the Germans brought their, their trades with them and their trade unions. And that's where the, the beginning of the labor movements. So when, with the building of the tenements in the 1830s, the, the uh, social movements, you know, because at that time, air and light were considered luxuries. And so activism is a word long associated with the East Village. So are protest, resiliency, individualism, diversity, tolerance, notwithstanding die yuppie scum, creativity and adaptability. Many of these words are reflective of the waves of immigrant groups that have resided here and have left their mark. It is in the neighborhood's DNA. Um, when I moved to the, to, the, um, to the block, the townhouses were being bought by, um, by, by families and they were taking them back from being uh, rooming houses. And that was being called um, a, a renaissance in the, in the 50s and the 60s. But um, that was only going on in the, in the um, Western part of the neighborhood. And what was going on in the Eastern part of the neighborhood was just, um, it, it was, it, as I say in the book, it, the, in, in the 70s and 80s, Alphabet City was a no man and except people live there. Um, the rubble strewn lots where tenements used to stand, um, New York became the, the largest landowner and with the city in the throes of an economic meltdown, Koch basically said, this is not going to stay. This, is, this neighborhood's not going to stay a multi-ethnic, multi-income um, you know, neighborhood. And the, the, uh, 
it, sh it should have, considering what the population who stayed there were going through, you'd have, you would have thought that would have been an easy sell, but it wasn't. And the community fought back and they fought back with flowers, with gardens and with colorful murals. And one of the things that um, I came out of researching and, and writing this book was how extraordinary uh, the people of Low East Side were in terms of their tenacity and in terms of fighting of fighting back. Um, and the gardens now are a big part of what uh, what the area is about. And um, as I, I say in the book, there was a tree grew in Brooklyn, and there's a there's a, a weeping willow in the East Village, and I hope it's still there after all the storms we've. Uh, we've had. Um, in the 1950s, the, um, uh, uh, you've heard of, of Moses, not our nice Moses, but um, the, the Moses, the, the, czar, the czar of development in uh, New York City. The, there was a slum area that, that was declared that was from Delancey Street to East 9th Street, 2nd Avenue to 3rd Avenue. And um, the, the planning czar, Robert Moses, had decided that this was all going to come down, all of it, and it was going to be redeveloped. And some two of the most extraordinary women that this neighborhood spawned in terms of activism, Esther Rand and Fran Golden, fought back and won, and won. Um, this place would have been a very, very different Probably none of us would have been here, uh, a different place. I, I have to say that I learned activism at the knee of Fran Golden. The first meeting that I went to when we were fighting up zoning on Third Avenue, she was knitting. And in my head, she became our Madame Defarge. And um, we were fighting attempts to, the city decided that the cure for drugs and prostitution was to upzone. If you have luxury buildings, you apparently don't have crime. Um, we didn't feel that way, <clears throat> excuse me. So Fran took some of the members of the planning commission and the board of estimate on a tour of the neighborhood. And there was one of those storefront um, fortune readers on Third Avenue. And Fran brought the head of the commission and he said, she said to him, why don't you have your fortune told. And the woman was sitting uh, outside of her space and she said, absolutely. And she turned over the cards and they spelled out no upzoning. We won, we won five times and we only lost when NYU uh, brought their Trojan ho horse called uh, community facility uh, among us. But the, the fight for affordable housing has been going on in this neighborhood from the 1930s to the 1950s, 1970s, 1980s, and now. Um, but as I said, I will never count this neighborhood out. Um, the rezoning that was done with, um, with um, going east, um, with all um, considerations being given to having affordable housing in some of these newer buildings. I, I, I hold out hope, I, I, I do. I, I, um, I think that we continue to be an extremely livable community. And um, I think that, I mean, some people, you know, I, I think sometimes I talk to people and they're evenly divided between there's nothing left to save or put a fence around everything we still have. And I think that the, the truth is somewhere in between. Uh, there are a few former fringe neighborhoods in Manhattan that retain the edginess that once defined them and the East Village is no exception. The community and police had a rapprochement in the 1990s following the Tompkins Square Park riot in 1988 as they discovered they were on the same side. With the introduction of community policing, longtime resident demands to rid the neighborhood of drugs, sellers, users, and buyers, as well as prostitutes, pimps, and johns were finally being responded to. 
the tide turned, it was now safe to stay out late and come out early in the morning. Um, but of course, there have been unintended consequences in terms of losing our, our, our shoemakers. But we're still a neighborhood of storefronts. And except for the shadows that are cast by those awful NYU buildings, we still have light and air. And with the, with, the, um, with the historic districts that were created, I mean, the St. Mark's historic district, it's rather amazing that it was um, designated when this was such a hard scrabble area um, and there was no Jackie Kennedy to help, there was no money and there were no preservation organizations, but a man named Davey Lerner who turned 100 today and still lives uh, uh, this year and still lives on Stuyvesant Street. He believed in it and he made it happen. And of course, Lesby, um, uh, I'm just gonna read for the, do a pitch for preservation. Um, hang on one second. Do I love this neighborhood? Yes. In many ways, the earliest residents of this neighborhood were heroes and heroines, and they had left all they knew and sailed to the unknown simply in search of a better life. They were no less brave than their counterparts who climbed into Conestoga wagons and headed west. We must honor their struggles by preserving the places where these newcomers lived, the first chapters of their American story and the footnotes of many of our own. Their tenement homes, humble as they may have been, more often than not had facades that exhibited more character through ornamentation and detail than the ubiquitous white high rises that visually homogenize much of the upper, um, upper East Side in the 20th century. One wonders how much the embellishments uplifted those who lived and worked in such otherwise drab surroundings. Um, historic districts create a shared sense of place. What remains of the past, be it decorative and or utilitarian, enriches our present and informs our future. There are streetscapes in the East Village that have not changed in more than a century. And far from sclerotic, they are stimulating places where the past and present live in harmony. Consciously or not, people, both visitors and residents, go out of their way to stroll streets that resonate with the energy and pride that comes from preserving the past in the midst of the hurried pace of daily life. Far from the idea of creating a museum, what Lesby seeks to preserve and celebrate is all that is still vibrant, still thriving, still diverse, and still quirky in the East Village community within the historic environment that gave it life and can you, continues to do so. That's my love letter. Richard? Richard? Yes, thank you, Marilyn. I think we can take questions for a minute, few minutes, right, Carolyn? No, we were going to have Marilyn's questions at the end. Oh, okay. okay. We're going to uh, introduce Whatever. photographers, if that's okay. Is that all right with you, Marilyn? So should I start yes. with uh, designing the book and then go into the photographers? Well, I get to introduce you first, Dono. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm going to share the screen while you guys do that. Okay. Um, I'd like to introduce Ono De Jong who is the graphic designer and also one of the photographers. And just to be on the quiet side, he's also the president of the board for Art Loy Sida Foundation and one of the founding members. Um, ono is an author and his book uh, For a Future is a philosophical uh, morality on, it's on morality, wisdom, spirituality, and the condition of humankind. He is a longtime practicing East Village artist, having participated in solo and group shows since the late 1990s, and is president of the board of Art Loy Saida. So, Ono, you're on. All right. Um, so, I was given the book by Richard. I originally worked on the logo and did a few other things for him. I'm exactly sure exactly what the time frame is with that. But what happened was that I. Um, he handed me a bunch of pictures and he said, okay, make a book. And I like looked at the pictures and it's like, I looked at the pictures and um, Marlis had taken, had just got a new digital camera and taken some pictures. And I know the great pictures she had. So it was like, 
I just felt like I needed to re recreate the book or to create the book in a way to make it make it live. And um, I got to talking with Marilyn and it was in, you know, it was don't write an introduction, just write what you want to write. And out of that came the, the really incredible writing. I just was just reading it tonight and it's absolutely uh, enthralling writing. So it's 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 a fabulous, fabulous um, journey when you read the whole story. Um, uh, but uh, when she wrote it, I was able to go ahead and intersperse the pictures between it. She, you know, I needed I needed a framework. She gave me that framework, and out of that came the photographs that and the placement of the photographs. Um, but it took a long time because we had to move from the original vision, which is a little introduction and then a bunch of pictures, to what I think is much more dynamic, integrated, and uh, really, just a, a a book that gives and explain you know it gives us what the East Village has been about and it characterizes it in a way that um, yeah that, so <clears throat> when Richard asked me to to take the photographs I'm going to talk about my own photographs in the book um, he had mentioned that he really wanted to have the people element the now element. Uh, that he didn't really want to have the, um, he didn't want it just to be like just artifact, artifacts of the buildings itself. He wanted to show that the, co the community was alive. And um, part of that in choosing my photographs was to, 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 to honor his wishes. So I got, you know, I saw some pictures of, that I had taken of people, of, of uh, skateboarders who I felt were, were a big part of the cent of, um, Central Park. Of Thompson Square Park, and um, I, it was right there at that time that uh, um, CPTVs was what was, was was the last day of CPTVs. I had just taken a picture of that, and it was just you know I felt like the whole change. There's a there's an image with there's a the store is still still there. Maybe it's still there. I don't know, but um, I have to go look now. But a uh, called throwback that I used, I took a picture of, and that was really in reading in uh, in, uh, in homage of of Marilyn's wonderful text. Because she does such a great job of just talking about the history and how the East Village came to be and its special place in the world, um, and so the the um, and I think that the, the two images I open up with, which are the um, the 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 a window a picture out of the East Village from my own window of from the hallway of my building which was all frosted over and it's a straightforward picture it's you know i, I did maybe pump up the color a little bit but that, that's about it and then a picture of what the tree that they've removed which i feel so kind of sad about um of the two trees in the Tom square park with um where the Hare krishnas did their thing and my, my little son's actually very small in that picture but it's just beautiful spread in this tree that one tree holding up the other tree and it was so fragile and I just felt it was so clumsy now that they removed it. It's like, what happened? But that's how it goes. Um, those are my photographs. I put them in there because I felt like I was the, the person editing it. I felt like I could help use those to kind of glue, glue together some of, the, some of the things that I knew that Richard had wanted to have in, 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 the, in the book. And um, I also you know, was very instrumental in, in digging in asking Marla's mom to go ahead and give us her old prints, because her old photographs that make up the center spread of the book. Um, they're just absolutely fantastic, and that wouldn't have happened unless I had really, without me chasing her down. And I'm really glad that they're in there, because they really provide the kind of a historical uh, lens on the East Village that that other would just would just no way to to capture in other in any other way. Do you want to go through your photos uh, one by one? Um, I think I did that, but I, you want to coordinate that. This is, here's the um, CBGBs last night. It was a big party. Oh, of course, wasn't invited, but sorry, right. it felt like it was a. I've been there so many times, and it was just kind of sad to see it see it go. It, it stood. I know it, it, it was there before I came. It's, it's, it's a history. It's historic, historic part of the East Village, and it's like capitalism. When you think of capitalism as creative destruction, you know it's hopefully new things come in its way. But it's part of the destruction of capitalism to keep mowing over what what was there. And um, 
you know, something I think what Marilyn was saying that in the, her activism part where East Villagers have, have stood, stood, stood against this, but unfortunately CBGBs wasn't part of what was saved. Um, next picture. So here we go. It's a, it's a wonderful scene in the East Village. A lot of new families moving in. Um, I haven't known this couple very briefly. I don't know where they are now, but they were um, a couple from Israel. Who are, who are, of course, in East Village is very international. We had our kid, raised him, and went to the Earth School and found that, um, you know, like all the parents were, you know, were, 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 the parents were very, were from a different country, different place, different nationality, different culture, different age, different. Everything was just thrown together. It was really very wonderful in that way. I think that's that's what made the East Village so special growing up, especially for my son. Who's uh, who, who? Who was able to embody that with as his starting starting ground? Um, but there's walking, and it's um, First Avenue and Second Street, I believe. Next, so this is a picture from my window. It is of the East Village looking east, um, and it's a straightforward picture of a sunrise. Um, the window being that way because of, uh, you know how windows are, are contain uh, these two glasses and somehow the inside of the glass is just all fogged over. So you get the kind of, kind of a very kind of a one of a kind dirty picture. And I, I like, I always like that, that, that series. Next. Um, skateboarders, uh, Richard had mentioned, I, he wanted some activity, some of the local culture. And I put these in because I felt that was just a big part of the the culture. I think the next picture will be the same the same group of people. Um, once it's you know it's the youth. It was the it's the my kid at that point wasn't that old to be part of the skateboarding gang, but it's um, it's just a celebration of 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 really the East Village has been is 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 a is a place for the youth. It has been, you know, now it's a place for the bridge and tunnel crowd for the eat, for eating and everything else. But um, while my son was growing up there, I really could identify with all of the young people growing up there and living there and making their home there, making their statements there. And I really enjoyed that. Next. That's Kieran. Okay. All right. I, uh, oh, no, thank you so much for everything that you've done and to help create this wonderful book. Yes, absolutely. Honor. It's something all good. Totally a labor of love from every one of us, and most especially from what you did in putting it together. Um, I'd like to introduce Kieran Tully. Uh, this Hi, time. Marilyn. Can you hear me? Yep, I can. Awesome. Kieran is originally from Dublin. Came here. Uh, I believe. Uh, you want to give me the date? <clears throat> My computer just, my laptop. Uh, 19, June 1990. Right. And Kieran lives on 7th Street, is a professional photographer. This is one of his signature pieces. Uh, it says a lot about our neighborhood. So at any rate, uh, Kieran, do you want to give us an overview of your work? Yeah. So, um, well, this one is, I call it the East Village. A lot of people that buy it just call it the I love you van, which is fine, you know. And um, it's in Tompkins Square Park and 10th Street in the background. And it's just what's written on the van. It's I love you. Absolutely. Just says it all. It says it all about about me, it speaks about me, it speaks about New York, my feeling towards New York. And um, yeah, I love it. It loves me. <laughs> <laughs> and this is my favorite butcher shop in the East Village. Um, I'll screw up the name, I'm sure. Bazinski's. And I can't remember when I shot it like you know uh seven years ago we'll say but that red van uh the guy was in the neighborhood for the longest time and he parked all over the place and one saturday morning actually it was about maybe early january um 
couple of years ago. I just saw it there in front of Bazinski's and I photographed it. And if you look closely at the inside of the shop, you can see two of the butchers waving at me and really made the shot what it is. So, next. This is Tompkins Square Park. Again, this was this one I remember, 2009, and it was Christmas Eve, 2009. I had just finished um, selling my work in in Union Square Holiday Market, and that Christmas Eve it was warm. It was like 50 or 60 degrees, and. Um, what was I going to say? Yeah, so what looks like snow is actually a ground fog because I think it suddenly got cold again and the cold and the heat mixed up and formed this fog. It was very, very, it looked like London all of a sudden. And so I'm in the park looking up uh, Ninth Street and just the lights, I just shot it out of focus. Mars Bar is not around anymore. Um, that is that is the East Village. To me, that's just East Village. Now it's uh, the condominium or something. But that's this is the New York I love. And here we go, Vazax. I mean, at least they're still there. And yeah. um, I believe they're selling beer out the window, which I think is hilarious. And I love, I especially love the guy selling ices on the right hand side. And I think he was, he didn't know what the hell, who, who I was or what I was doing, but he decided to move in case I was like a, a policeman or something like that, going to check his license. Um, but before he moved, I, I caught him there. So, does anybody know what Vizak Hall was? Is that, does that mean anything, or is it just um, was that the guy who owned the bar? Does anybody know that? Anyway, so I believe picture... I believe it was there was a hall, like a Ukrainian hall or something. Oh, okay. Like a music hall or something. Yeah, something like that. Sweet. Okay. Um, yeah. So then the bean. This one. Actually, I remember this one too. This was like um, 2010, and also it was after Christmas, and it snowed, and it was before the New Year. Um, and I just I got as far as the Bean on Ninth Street, First Avenue, and I got that shot. And I turned back because it was freezing, and um, I suddenly realized I didn't want to be out in it. But I, I got like that one awesome shot. And then the one beside a television man, uh, this guy woke me up one evening, one actually early one morning. He was screaming at TV. It was like three o'clock in the morning. It was during the summer. And I just it just drove me insane. I could I could hear the TV, he had the volume up and he was screaming at it. And I just thought, the hell. I'm going to photograph this guy. So I, I was up, I, I, there was no way I was getting back to sleep. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll make something out of this. And I got that shot. I, I love that one. That's also, to me, that's so East Village as well. Thank you so much, Karen. Yeah, no problem. Ed. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, it's all pleasure. That, um, okay. I'd like to introduce Don Freeman. Um, Don is a professional photographer who specializes in architectural photography and interiors. Uh, that and Don, are you? Hi, here? Carolyn. Sorry, my Hi. my camera's not working, so I get to be shy and no. Uh, no. Oh, okay. So at any rate, Don has lived in the neighborhood for over thirty years. His uh, professional photographer shows work at several different galleries in New York City. Um, so I want to give a brief, uh, let Don give you an overview of his work as we go through the slides. 
Okay. Um, this was a hard assignment for me because I'm normally shooting interiors, architecture, very composed images. I rarely get to go out onto the street and sort of, you know, explore what I've always seen every day, but with the camera. Um, so these, the first one is Jesus Saves, which is really one of my most favorite um, places to walk by. Um, I think it's on, uh, what is it? Um, 10th or 11th? Um, 11th Avenue, Street. Avenue, Avenue B. Um, again, I'm, you know, I'm not really a historian, so I don't know a lot about, you know, like I don't really delve into histories or, stories about places but I do love architecture and I love the light and I you know there I just love the tree just coming right in the middle of it because it's sort of you know the East Village we're so lucky that we have trees you know everywhere and so yeah I mean I think I did this whole series because Richard asked um, I wanted to do really like you know already close-up architectural details of of uh, you know of the things I do like um, you know, like uh, fire escapes and door handles and <laughs> hallways and dark, you know, empty rooms, which is kind of my genre. But so, you know, it was nice to get out of my comfort zone. I'm also very, very shy. So I'm afraid, you know, I, I really don't come up to people like, like Ouija or Diane Arbus and snap their pictures. Um, I ask, I, you know, I, I just lose the moment. So, you know, that's just uh, my technique. I, I'm very, I, I think the camera, you know, for me, shouldn't, shouldn't impose itself onto people's privacy. So, so yeah, I mean, when Richard asked me to do it, I was a little confused because what I do is I shoot interiors, artists, artists' homes and houses. I made a film called Art House. You know, it's all very, I'm not gonna say contrived, but it's very art, you know, it's very set up. It's very designed and by myself, but but still, you know, I think we don't I don't walk around, you know, the East Village with a camera. I I love looking. So it was nice to bring out my camera and do it. For this for this project, and I was very happy to do it, Carolyn. We we run into each other all the time on the street, and you know it's I live on I lived on Ninth Street for quite a while, and then um, I've had shows in the '80s in the East Village, and lived in the West Village, the Meatpacking District, and the Carriage House, and the, I've seen all these places go and change. I lived in Soho, you know, in a abandoned building that now is you know a very nice little shop. Anyway, you know the story. So it's it's nice to walk around and explore. So yeah, this is Jesus Saves. <laughs> um, oh, these are like so wonderful. And I met, I met Rolando. He's the artist who did these beautiful winter flowers that, you know, lined the park, uh, you know, f on, on, uh, on ninth and, uh, Correct me if I'm wrong. Eighth and is it eighth, ninth and and C I mean, and C. they're not there anymore. But I've heard that they're coming back. Um, so hopefully he yeah. saved what he could. They, they oh. they've put them up along Avenue C. Oh, they have. Okay. Yeah. I mean that park is always so special, but the wisteria, you know, blew down and they took that out and then there were chickens, but those died, you know, so the, that park alone, you know, has, has seen a lot of bad times, <laughs> but, but I, you know, think it, at that time when I lived right there on that block, it was um, just so wonderful to see all the flowers blowing in the wind. And I loved meeting him for a brief moment. Um, again, I didn't want to take his picture because I, uh, I, I, I do feel like uncomfortable with people, you know, like taking their, I don't know, like their spirits, but, but, you know, objects to me explain and, and architecture and, you know, it tell, tell the story to me. So, so that's what this is, winter flowers. I also did details. I went and shot, I shot like over 300, you know, close-ups of all of these. And then I oh, put wow. together a collage put together a collage so the first time we had uh, the, the gallery show for the book I showed those instead of these pictures which are in the book which are you know um which 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 is great that's what Richard wanted so here we are La Plaza Cultural <laughs> yeah La Plaza Cultural Cultural um 
And one day my friend Noemi and I just walked around the city and, and I got her to just sit, sit at these, you know, dining tables and pose and she's on a cell phone here. That's how I like to put people in my pictures. Obviously they're models or, you know, they've been put there. Um, but yeah, Yaffa Cafe, I mean, I was there all the time, you know, and, and I loved it. So um, yeah, I like this. I like the shot of her outside this, this phone. This, this restaurant anyway um next oh yeah and i i always love this building a lot it's what is it the um the um the old children's society school and like 1887 i think it was built it was also a location and for one of my favorite films called in america and i think at the time because i have been inside and i have met a few one one tenant and I interviewed um, uh, Alistair Gordon for my film art house in his apartment because it's they're so beautifully um, designed and um, there's there's so many beautiful details. Anyway, he he explained that it was quite run down and um, and when it was used for that movie, it was you know basically very like a tenement. So um, yeah, and then the trees were blooming and the light was pretty. So. That was that was that experience. <laughs> the right shot. Yeah, that's a nice one. I like, and that's it. I only have four pictures in the book, so. But it was a pleasure, and you know, I'm happy that. Uh, We're so glad. I'm happy that I could be a part of it. it. It was great to have you as part of it, Don. Thank you. So I'm have um, to, get, to exit the share screen for a minute because we're having a little situation, but uh, th we can get right back to it in one second. Okay. Um, next up is George Hirose. And George has been active in the East Village and the LAS since 1978 when he first fell in love with the culture and the, variety, uh, the vitality of the area. He is also a local community gardener and activist. And for the last 10 years, he's been working on an extensive series of night photographs called Midnight in the People's Garden, documenting community gardens across the city and working on a book of the same name. He's currently an associate professor of photography at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, uh, New York, and his fine art photography has been widely exhibited in one person and group shows throughout the United States and abroad. George also works for the Japan Society and several other nonprofit organizations as a freelance professional photographer documenting events, public programming, and art installations. So George, are you here? Uh, yes, hi everybody. Uh, yes, thank, thank you. Uh, first I wanna thank everybody uh, like Richard and Carolyn and Anno and uh, uh, you know, Crystal and you know, there's such a wonderful network of support um, that I've, you know, come to experience uh, being around this neighborhood and, you know, my, my fellow community gardeners and, you know, it's, it's a real, you know, beautiful sort of cosmic sort of thing to, to be here. Uh, when I first started coming down to, to the village was probably when I was 13 or 14 years old. I lived in the West Bronx off the last stop of the one train and I would come down and, you know, I'd come down and, you know, score weed or whatever and just watch people, you know, on the street. And it was like so magical to me because it was so sort of conservative where, where I had been from, yet it was part of New York City. You know, it's kind of, the West Bronx is very different. And, um, you know, when I discovered the East Village, uh, it was just, a, you know, I, I was always felt different, you know? And then I would just, you know, just see people that, you know, just were free. And it was kind of like the Wild West, you know, just kind of, you know, a new territory for me. And, you know, it was really fucked up in ways, but it, you know, it was like, it kept the wrong people out. You know, it was ours, you know, and, and um, you know, I'm so glad that, you know, it was so decrepit for a while that a lot of buildings got saved because developers wouldn't come in and, you know, before, you know, preservation laws and things and, and destroy buildings. Um, you know, um, of course there were a lot of buildings that got ended up getting burnt out and things, but, you know, a lot was saved because it wasn't developed early. Um, yeah, this was a, um, a cafe, outside a cafe uh, off of Thompson Square Park in St. Mark's. St. Mark's was kind of just a lifeline. Uh, uh, Little Tokyo was there. I'm Japanese American. Uh, I just cannot be anywhere uh, far away from, uh, uh, you know, all those sources of, uh, you know, groceries and food 
and things like that. And uh, this guy, uh, you know, there's characters that would inhabit the, the village that you would see over and over again. And, um, you know, it's, you know, I would so CBGBs with my local bar for a while, you see the same people over and over again. And it just kind of, they made up the flavor of the neighborhood. Um, okay, you can go to the next slide. Oh, um, Sixth and B Community Garden. Uh, wow, so much of my life has been based there. Uh, it, it's, uh, I remember when they first started to clear it out in around 79, 80, uh, they, they had a big dumpster and they were just trying to pull out all the rubble. They found cars and things. It used to be an old garage. It was just, just completely just decrepit, uh, uh, you know, sort of, you know, rubble strewn lot, which there are many of in the city. Uh, now there's about 50 gardens uh, because of the fact that, you know, these, these were kind of forsaken places that the city didn't know what to do with. And a lot of them were, you know, landlords had demolished, uh, burnt down their buildings and things like that. And, you know, they turned into crack houses and then neighborhood, uh, people in the neighborhood just wanted to like to beautify it. Uh, the city didn't know what to do. Uh, they wanted to create uh, places, safe places for the children to play. And, um, uh, you know, it really, um, you know, so much happens at night in, in the East Village. Um, uh, the, all my images are long exposures uh, done on a tripod, uh, anywhere from maybe five seconds to uh, 20 minutes. So I, I try to get, you know, maximum quality out of my images. Uh, I just love that these two people uh, sat still for about 30 seconds staring in, into each other's eyes. Uh, and I always look for people that are kind of still uh, and, you know, also, uh, you know, have counterpoint of movement and things like that. Uh, but this is Sixth and B Community Garden, um, wonderful place. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, open Road Garden. Uh, uh, they, uh, this is a garden that was connected to the local school, and uh, they, you know, the kids would go there and, and you know, garden and have plots. And you know, there's been generations and generations of of students that have, you know, have been through there. Um, uh, that's this is on uh, 11th Street uh, off of First Avenue. It's far. Uh, west as the garden district goes um, up, up in that neighborhood. Uh, so a lot of people don't even know it's there. Uh, next, please. Oh, uh, Old Lakeside Lounge. Um, wow, um, I saw so many bands there, uh, so many local bands, and um, they always had this red glow outside the place. And, you know, it's, it's uh, the, the doorway next to it is this kind of classic graffiti strewn uh, doorway. And you can see Life Cafe down the block. Um, I, uh, my wife and I had our uh, a, a wedding uh, reception at right around the corner in a place called the Limbo Lounge. Um, and, you know, there were homeless people making a fire out front and my, our, our best woman got mugged on the way home. And, you know, it was totally messed up, but it was like, so great. You know, it's just, uh, you know, it's just, it was just a place to be and, and, and you know, have a, ma have a wedding reception back in 84. So, um, yeah. Uh, uh, next, please. Uh, uh, Black Drugs, uh, you know, 1885, you know, the store has been there since 1885. Uh, the a fam, you know, family that, that uh, runs it is just, just wants to keep the uh, landmark um, alive. And uh, uh, once again, I really like lights that sort of shine on, on things. Uh, the red lights uh, look like, kind of like strawberry sherbet or something to me. Um, and, um, I think that might be the last image of mine, uh, but uh, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So uh, that's that's me. Um, thank you so much for listening. Okay, thank you. Thank you, George. <laughs> and, we really uh, appreciate all the energy that you put into this neighborhood and the love. Thank you. Love it. All right, I'm gonna uh, Marlise. I believe in Puerto Rico right now. Uh, these are her images that were shot here in the '70s. Uh, Marlies came to here from Germany as a fashion photographer, and she came. To, uh, she was telling me that she was going to uh, a shoot that she was being chauffeured to a shoot, and they, they came through the neighborhood, and she was entranced. And she became involved with an organization called Chata Selbo Hill, that is at six hundred five. It was at six hundred five East Ninth Street, and also were the founders of La Plaza Cultural in nineteen seventy eight. So these incredible images. Um, the first image is Bomba Plena dancers, 
uh, they were on a stage at, I believe, on the East River. And it's just so, it's so incredibly evocative of the spirit of the neighborhood and of the Puerto Rican diaspora that came to this country. They actually came here originally to work in the cigar factories that were established by the uh, Bavarians in the 1840s. And then as the Bavarians became more successful, they brought people from Puerto Rico and Cuba and Santo Domingo to work in the factories. So then there was a big thing in the 1950s when the bottom went out of the sugar market and the U.S. gave uh, people in Puerto Rico $50 uh, to come to New York to work in the service industries. And they ended up, a lot of them settling here in the Lower East Side, particularly in the East Village and what we now call Lo Saida. Uh, which is basically from Avenue A to Avenue D from 14th Street down to, I think it goes almost down to, they, they consider south of Houston, but now it's basically from 14th to Houston. Um, and Avenue C has been called Loisida Avenue. So there was a lot of self-help going on that I first came to this neighborhood in I think 1984 I lived on 7th Street between 76 and 81, and you didn't go past Tompkins Square Park at night after dark, uh, and then you came over here, and the city demolished a lot of buildings between 1984 and 1989. Uh, when I moved back to the neighborhood in 89, it looked like Berlin after the war, almost, with the number of buildings that had been demolished. And people tried to take charge of their lives and they organized, uh, as you can see, the Lower East Side, this land is ours. Um, the, uh, many of them became involved in sweat equity buildings and Marlies it was also very involved with that. So is there another, uh, more slides of Marlies's work? No, just these two. And there's just these two. a hand for a question. Uh, it, it, do you want to take a question? Um, sure. Yes, uh, I don't see who you are, but you have your hate. Rant, Robin hand. Gottlieb. Yes, I grew up on the Lower East Side. May I ask that building, the Children's Aid Society, that red building, is right. that the one on uh, 8th Street in the corner of Avenue B? Yes, it is. It's right across so the street. So you missed um, a very important part of history that used to be Eshi. East Side Hebrew Institute. Right. Um, I, I mean, you, you, you're, you're erasing uh, the 60s, the 70s of that building um, by only bringing up the real estate of the current situation and the, from the last century. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. So uh, let's go to the next slide. Okay. It'll let me. So I'm sorry. So Eshi is not mentioned with uh, by that photograph at all. I beg your pardon. Book? I'm sorry. Uh, the, the, book uh, actually, was, the book actually was, doesn't illustrate. Um, it doesn't talk about the history of specific photographs. The photographs are are more general and evocative. Um, I see. Are, Thank you. Yes. Thank you. That explains it. Yeah. Okay. These are photographs by Alan Gastelum. Alan lived on 10th Street between uh, 1st and A when I first met him. He's a professional photographer. He's originally from California. And he became very involved in the neighborhood. He even did a whole stint uh, uh, trying to clean up the banks of the East River uh, off East River Park and doing a lot of uh, neighborhood activism. And unfortunately, he was a casualty to uh, a landlord who wouldn't provide heat and um, various and sundry other things. So in the long, he moved to Brooklyn and then they moved back to California. But these are his, two of his shots. Um, the first is the parade down Avenue B. You can see St. Bridget in the background and uh, the building on the corner of Avenue B, which started out as a home for uh, homeless newsboys built by the Children's Aid Society and morphed into a yeshiva in the 20s, I believe. 
So at any rate, um, it's now co-ops and uh, been, it, it was part of the film as uh, Don pointed out. But um, I'm not sure if this is part of one of the uh, events from St. Bridget because they frequently have pageants that come down Avenue B. But the next photograph is something that we all love, uh, Ray's Candy Store, which is on Avenue A, um, right off of 7th Street, right around the corner from Kieran. And the guy that you see standing in front of it is Kim, who many of us in the neighborhood know. Um, he used to have Kim's, which was on 7th Street uh, between 1st and A. And it's just, you know, all of the photographs in the book are truly a labor of love by the photographers. It's just, you know, we've all been entranced with their neighborhood and the vitality, um, oh, the eclectic what a new quality. Mm -hmm. That what? Robin, can you mute, please? Okay. So at any rate, um, Alan wasn't able to join us tonight, but we really appreciate his input and his contribution to the book. So um, now it should be open for uh, Q&A. So if you're interested in um, asking questions uh, to either Marilyn or any of the photographers, could you please raise your hand? Carolyn, may I just say something about the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society? Sure. Because um, we talk specifically in the book about the building where um, it, 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 the building that started as the Astor Library on Lafayette um, then became the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society and then became Lincoln, uh, the public theater. And I talk about it specifically in the book of that the, the, set, the incarnations that the building went through from philanthropy to social justice to the performing arts are so much a microcosm of what our community has been about. So it definitely gets mentioned. Also Abe Le Lebowal, uh, who are the wonderful owner of the Second Avenue Deli who was murdered, his family, when they came from Europe, um, were they, went there to the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society and he always talked about the fact that he never got very far away from there. Um, and um, Abe used to say in the bad years, um, just, just to add this, because he really deserves honorable mention, he used to call, he used to say East Village was a good girl with a bad reputation. So does anyone have uh, questions for any of the photographers or for Marilyn? Yeah, let me stop sharing the screen for a minute because I'm not able to see people raising their hand. Um, let's see here. Nope, that doesn't look that way. Um, you're not showing my video, but may I ask a question, Margaret Flanagan? Yes, please. Um, you talk about the German uh, influx into the neighborhood. Do you have any shots uh, of Third Street between A and B, what they used to call the German Cathedral, Most Holy Redeemer Church? That's it's, It was built in 1842 or something. No, it, no the, the photographs, you know, as I mentioned before, really more, um, you know, the artist's inspiration uh, of what strikes them as kind of embodying this, the, the, the contemporary spirit of the East Village with the background of historic buildings. So I, it, the, the book wasn't looked at so much as, as categorizing, you know, the, the different histories and different architectures that you find in the neighborhood. Although that would, you know, would be another nice theme for a book. Uh, but, but no, we don't, we don't, uh, we don't have any um, photos of that. Richard, can I jump in with a question? Please. Hi, Bill. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, to the organizers and also thank you to the uh, artists for not only sharing your beautiful photographs, but your stories behind how you how you saw things, how you took them. I'm going to preface my question by saying I don't live in New York City. 
um, but I do have connections to it. And sort of the narrative in the background has been not only the introduction, but things I hear, things I read about, things I hear from friends is just how much the East Village Lower East Side is changing and and not for the better. So my question for the artists is what what are your thoughts on how you how you photograph that? How do you try and see it and represent it? That that tension. Uh, the, I skimmed through the photos as I was um, you know uh, listening to the introductory remarks uh, from the the, uh, the theater's <laughs> website, and they're they're just beautiful. They sort of make it out to be this. Uh, you know, it's like almost sort of unchanging sort of place, the place that embodies so much for so many people. But what, what, what you hear, you know, from the 30,000 foot view is something very different. So, so what are your thoughts on how you kind of represent that? Oh no, do you want to give that a shot? Well, pictures represent this moment, frozen moment in time. So that's all, you know, that was the book. It was a certain time. We all went out to, we took pictures. The pictures are pretty contemporary of, in creating the book. Um, has the East Village changed? Yes, it has. I raised a son there, and I can say I'm very happy the, of raising it at the time I did. And that is, it was a good time. It was a very safe time, um, and yet it was still kind of very colorful. I, um, I feel it is less colorful as time goes on, as as the gentrification gets priced things. You know, I I now see a small community of people who've been there for thirty or plus years, and I feel like it's a you know we can remember a world that was very different, and we're kind of bracing for the world to come. But it's um, you know I'm also getting older. I'm starting to see the you know I'm not I'm no longer as engaged as I was in in what the cultural identity was. I'm just you know. So I'm just keeping keep keep going keep going and it's like um you know i, I just change it gonna it's it's gonna be there and yet it is still a lot of vibrancy i mean now that with uh with COVID 19 unfortunately it's a very restaurant and you know base place being hit very hard which in some ways is going to open it up and hopefully some of the landlords are going to reduce some of the rents and we get more interesting mm -hmm. stories so it used to be that you'd see all kinds of crazy stories because people could afford it now you know it's only who only those who can afford it can be there and it's really reduced to kind of the individuality of the place the the, the funkiness the, that used to be there it used to be much more um you know somebody had a great idea that you could make a flight it wasn't so difficult to get it off the ground. Now it's really pretty canned. It's not allowed because by the time you get something to fly, it, it takes a lot. But it still happens, and there's still a lot of funky. And it's a lot of old timers, and all the old timers really warm my heart. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that means me. <laughs> I can say a couple of words. Um, uh, this is George. Uh, you know, I, I try to be a really optimistic person, you know, and uh, I, you just try, have to try a little harder. Um, you know, I'm very involved with the community gardens, um, and I feel like, you know, the gardens are basically all squats, you know. Uh, they're, you know, it's, it's the people came in, took over, wouldn't give it back, and the city had to negotiate. Uh, you know, uh, there are many people like uh, that, that live in the squat buildings that have become, you know, sort of like condos and things like that. I spent a lot of time at the Lower Saida Center, uh, where the kind of the core of the uh, New Rican community is, and there's an art center, and we, you know, do puppet shows and things like that. So you just have to try a little harder to find the communities, but uh, the community gardens are like a, a great way to, to sort of embrace, uh, you know, something that um, was a solid, you know, sort of base of what the culture was. Uh, and it still exists. And I, I don't think anything's gonna change the East Village so drastically that uh, it won't be an exciting, most interesting place uh, in the city. You know, it's, it's I, I can't think of any other place in the city that's quite like that. So that's just wanna say a couple words. I agree. Yeah, that, uh, I think we all do. <laughs> We're Tom, a tough bunch. You wanted, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Sorry. Don, Don Freeman and Karen. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, I, I think photography has changed so much um, in the last three or four years that I really do not get that inspired by 
by taking pictures in the city anymore. I mean, you just have so many people sh shooting with their iPhones and doing TikTok videos. And, you know, the whole Instagram is kind of taken over by, uh, by amateur photographers. So, you know, it's hard to be a photographer now and one that I've been one for 30 years, you know, and I know how to use a dark room. It, it's just kind of, it's just change, you know, but I'm glad people are happy taking pictures. I mean, it's a wonderful experience. And I think they, I think um, we'll just have to see what happens, you know, but if people can explore the world that they live in and in, in a relatively, you know, um, inspiring way, and that would include the East Village, uh, and New York. I would love, I mean, I'm not there right now. I'm upstate New York and I could have fled for COVID, but you know, the idea of seeing New York empty, you know, it, it's horrible, but it would also be quite photogenic, you know? So actually I kind of wish I were there. Um, Paris people, you know, so many people in the streets and Paris mm -hmm. and Rome, you know, can you imagine what it would be like to go to Pompeii right now and have like, you know, uh, 10 people there instead of 10 million, you know? So I don't know. I mean, being a photographer is about exploring, you know, the period in time in which you're there, you know? So now is now and five years ago was five years ago and 10 was 10 and 20 was 20, you know? And I think that photography will be always there to remind us of the way places looked. So we, you know, it can be nostalgic, but it can also be a, a great learning device on, on how to keep and maintain, you know, the beauty that the city holds for us, you know, and hopefully it won't be destroyed by, you know, corporations and, <clears throat> and we just have to hold on to the historical elements and the people have to learn how to live within that and be respectful of nature and, and the environment in which they live. So, so you know, it's changing, but, but it will get better. And, you know, we've had a horrible year and um, I love and enjoy seeing pictures of, of the East Village on Instagram and Facebook. So let's just keep going with that, you know. <laughs> well, we will. Be nice when you can come back. <laughs> it would be nice. And Karen, did you did you want to add anything? Yeah, sure. Um, that's why I shoot out of focus. A lot of my better pictures are out of focus for that reason. And <clears throat> one picture I took recently, uh, Cat's Deli on Houston Street and Orchard. And I've been avoiding it for years because of the monstrosity that's built around it. And I just, you know, I go down there all the time and I eat their food and stuff. And I just, I had to photograph it. So um, I used Photoshop. Well, I used Photoshop on it because all my work is digital. But in this case, with Cat's Deli, I minimized the buildings all around it and I made them simply nothing because I hated them. They just, they disgusted me. What should have been there was like Orchard, Orchard Street or Eldridge Street should be where that monstrosity is. And I did it with hatred. I got to tell you, and I made, I made cats look beautiful and the building around it, uh, pretty much just a pencil drawing. And, um, I was surprised. People love it. People love the picture because they love Castelli. And they asked me, what did, you, what did you do? What did you do to that stupid building that's there? I said, yeah, I just reduced it to a pencil drawing on, a, on an architect's uh, desk. And that's what I thought. That's what I thought of those buildings. They're just boring, ugly, and destroy the East Village, destroy New York City, in fact. So that's my, my way around it is to, um, you know, you can't, what can you do? You know, can, how can you stop these people? Um, I don't think you can. So trying to do, but, uh, what's that? That's what Lesbie's trying to do is, is stop. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, that's why, that's why I like you guys. But so that, that's my, that's my solution to it. I mean, I make my living selling this, this stuff. I have to keep producing new work. And so I will either shoot out of focus, and if that's not appropriate, um, I'll just reduce whatever is horrible around it. <laughs> so 
but uh, yeah, so that's that's my solution to it. Well, thanks, Karen. Uh, thank Jennifer, you. you have a question? You're muted, by the way. Yeah, I'm actually Jennifer's husband, Ken. Um, and and uh, I'm, let's see, start the video here. No, you can't. can't start the video, oh well. Um, we're, at, we're going through a, a rather profound time now with the uh, pandemic. Uh, it's really kind of changed. I, I feel like it's changed the fabric and the, the timber of the city. Um, and particularly the Lower East Side and the East Village. Uh, and I wonder, uh, just for the panel, what would be the panel's advice for uh, either an amateur or professional photographer um, uh, taking pictures or even just, you know, observing with their naked eye? Um, you know, what are the things to look for? What are the things to... Um, be cognizant of, you know, at this time. Shoot in winter when the sun is low, so you get a lot of relief in the buildings. It's uh, since the Renaissance the idea of being able to make the flat space come out and give it volume. So when, when you, whenever you can do that, that should be that's what makes a good picture because we like it we, we like things that are concrete and that are space occupy space and to try to make your picture spatial also too there's a lot to be said about doing close up because so many people walk down the street they have no idea they do not look at the details on the buildings and the artisans that it took to create the details on the buildings and some of them are little miniature works of art that people walk by every day and never ever notice it Thank you. So, and I might add, <clears throat> I go way back. Uh, uh, Carolyn described, I can, I, I can elaborate a little bit more on Marlise, his work, um, which in one of the shots, you see the dancers, like a burned out uh, area, which Carolyn described, it looked like burned out Berlin. Well, I'm one of the original homesteaders and so I know Marlise going way, way back um, as a photographer and as a early homesteader. And so the building that I actually live in now, uh, when you walked in the front door, all you had to do is just stare straight up and you'd see birds flying in the sky over the building because we had no roof. So we dedicated every weekend going in and building the building putting in floors and all this kind of stuff. And I had no background in that area whatsoever, but yet it's, I was very young and we had determination. And you mentioned the, the parks that, or the uh, gardens we have in the area. We were one of the first gardens in the city where we got a dumpster and started hauling out old mattresses, burned out mattresses and bricks and what have you. And so many of the detailing that came down with the buildings that fell in the rubble we were pulling to the side to use as ornamentation in the gardens. But they were originally the uh, ornamentation on the facades of these wonderful buildings around here. But um, it was quite a time back then. I used to look out my window and see drug dealers lining beer bottles up and shooting them in the city for target practice. And it's very, very interesting now since the area has completely changed over uh, the city comes to us, oh, well, we gave you your apartment for nothing. I got news for you. When we arrived here, we had to work every weekend, year in, year out, year in, year out. The city gave us nothing. On the contrary, we turned around the area, turned around the area so that it was safe. You could walk down the street way back when you could call there would be an issue you'd call the policeman and the policemen were told not to show up so we had to deal with it ourselves wow so it was really something else so i've seen huge transitions from way way back when and uh it uh, some things are wonderful uh, some things not so wonderful but but cities and, and locations and populations are always in transition but no matter what 
moment in time, you can always find incredible things happening. Thank you. Any location. I, I, I think that historic preservation in a city like New York, where, where everything is thought of in terms of dollars, I think they're miracles. And I think what Leslie and the others have done in terms of creating the, the last two historic districts, when there was not another historic district between 1969 and 2012, and the East Village Lower East Side contains 330 buildings, I think, Richard. I mean, these are little miracles. And it's part of the reason that the East Village remains human scale. And if we could, if we could blot out, as, as uh, Kieran does with his photography, the NYU buildings, there would be a lot more light. Um, but I think that the historic preservation is something that gives me a tremendous amount of optimism. Um, because it's all about hope um, and it's all about saving what's valuable. And the fact that the street historic district um, contained tenements, which is so much a part of the history of this community and of social reform in this city. These things have been saved. This is very valuable real estate and the developers are not winning. Um, I've been here for 52 years. Um, maybe I'm just a glasses half full kind of gal, but I can't imagine living anywhere else because everywhere else has changed too and they didn't have that much to start with. Hmm. That's my opinion. Well, Lesby has done an amazing job for just a small organization. They've had impact and they've really captured a huge audience in relation to pointing out the situation that exists. And we have to act now to save the beautiful environment, the, his the history that we have in this region and uh, really push it up front, no doubt about it. I've been involved in preservation of a number of historical uh, elements and it's very interesting. We'd have to fight like crazy and we'd be successful and then afterwards, everyone was thrilled. Oh, look at this. It's wonderful that we preserved this, that we saved this. I see that every time. But it's those people who, who step up to the plate and say something and do something that it's for the masses. It's just not a, a selfish thing. And so the East Village is just an amazing place. It's my favorite place. I couldn't live anywhere else in the city other than here. It, it's it's Thanks. so highly livable, and unless you want to cross the Lancy or go over the Williamsburg Bridge, neither of which I want to do, um, it's to me it's still the best. It's just it's it's highly livable. It really is. Um, well, I'd like to show people how they can order the book if they if if they or pick up the book if they would like to. Uh, let me share my uh, screen here again if I can do that, and. Um, Let's see here. Okay, here we go. Can you can everybody see that? Um, okay, so it should be available theoretically at McNally Jackson in the source. I think the source uh, is um, open uh, kind of uh, more or less by appointment. And McNally Jackson, I think that the stocking there is a little irregular because of the uh, coronavirus. So we would recommend that you call both of these places first. We have the numbers uh, listed for you. Or you can email me at info at lesby-nyc.org and I'll give you the particulars. It's a beautifully produced book uh, thanks, thanks to Ono's direction. Um, it's beautifully laid out and, uh, and, and although it's a soft cover, it, it, it's on a very thick, uh, beautiful paper. So, um, you know, uh, let us know if you're interested in that. And, uh, you know, we hope you'll help us uh, try to preserve the East Village and Lower East Side. And uh, going forward, we have uh, some irons in the fire, such as a new historic district around the Tenement Museum, uh, another historic district that we're looking at, um, at the uh, Oliver Street. Um, 
area, which is uh, originally where uh, Governor Al Smith lived and, uh, and, and grew up, which is a, a fascinating district, as well as Chinatown and, um, uh, you know, various individual landmarks. So what we feel that <clears throat> as much as we can, you know, the time is, is to move now, e even in this ch challenging environment, because the next wave of de development is certainly going to demolish, you know, whatever, whatever's left uh, that's not being protected by landmarking. So uh, personally, I want to thank all the participants tonight, uh, Marilyn, Ono, uh, George, uh, and um, Don, and uh, Kieran, and uh, as, as well as uh, Carolyn and Art Lois Saida. And did I mention you, Ono? Did I to thank uh, Ono especially as well? And um, Crystal. And Crystal, yes, uh, at the for the New City. So uh, I want to thank everybody and all of you for coming and participating. Uh, you know, it was a lot of fun. And uh, Marilyn, of course, is always Yes. Thank you all so much. And uh, thank you. Good night. Thank you for putting it together. Good night. And thank you all for coming. Um, thank you. Happy New Year. Hope you've enjoyed it. And we look forward to seeing you. And we hope you'll check out our book. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. A great Bye. 2021, everybody. Yes. A better Happy, healthy, healthy and prosperous New Year, everybody. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.